Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is David Stewart. I'm the warm-up act for Travis. Um, I've done this uh, conference, I think, three or at least maybe four times. And it occurred to me last night that actually I seem to always go on just before him. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not quite sure what that means, but I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, uh, interpret it positively. <clears throat> Um, so, today uh, we want to talk about API abuse again. I talked about API abuse last year and gave some examples um, of the kind of things that we've seen in our business. I'll talk a little bit about what we do in a moment. Um, but this time uh, I want to take a slightly different approach and go into some really quite interesting detail about one, one or two specific uh, instances that we've seen in the last year. To give you an idea of what actually goes on, and, and in a sense to challenge you to think about whether this might be going on on the APIs that you provide, um, and you, you just may not know about it. So um, Approve is our product, and Approve is a API security solution specifically for mobile or IoT devices, so remote clients. Um, so those are the kinds of attacks I'm going to talk about. They're obviously not the only attacks that go on, but it is actually the, the we think the most difficult uh, solution to uh, to come up with uh, for reasons which I'll come come to in a moment. So the first thing I did was I thought, right, okay, so what is API abuse exactly? And I thought I would go out and find an interesting uh, definition for it. There's an OWASP one which is not bad, um, which suggests that it's all to do with the caller and what the caller does how they approach the API, how they try and use it, what's their intention, et cetera, which is reasonable. But then, of course, as we all know, the real truth about anything is on Reddit. So um, I went and had a look there and um, found some quite interesting uh, definitions of what API abuse is according to the uh, wonderful people that are on Reddit, probably most of you. But what was interesting about this was that there was a lot of focus on rate limiting and you know, the, the assumption is that if that you, you're, you're abusing an API if you hammer it with lots of uh, you know, uh, requests. Um, and I think it's an awful lot more complicated than that. Um, but that perhaps tells you something about the way in which APIs are typically protected in, in that. And that's one of the topics I'm going to come back to. So I'm sure many of you who, who provide APIs have a rate limiting on it. Uh, and I'm going to call, I'm going to question uh, what kind of rate limiting you're actually doing. So first of all, um, there are also two types of API abuse. And I'm going to focus mainly on one of these two today. Uh, one of them is uh, to do with uh, vulnerabilities. There's a lovely definition of vulnerability here, which doesn't apply at all in the context of what we're talking about today. Vulnerabilities are clearly a very bad thing. Um, and you may well have vulnerabilities uh, in your APIs, and obviously that's a bad thing. You should obviously take, uh, you know, do something about that. Um, there are uh, solutions that will help you find and uh, fix vulnerabilities in your APIs. Uh, we work uh, uh, with uh, 42 Crunch, who are doing a presentation this afternoon. If you're interested in this topic, then I would suggest that you you, you go along to that one. The second one is um, spoofing or impersonating uh, remote clients, uh, which is the one that I'm going to talk about because that's really what we do. Now here, you're not actually exposing, you're not, you're not um, um, exploiting a vulnerability. In fact, the API traffic and requests you're, you're, you're you're providing are entirely genuine. They are extremely difficult to tell the difference between those and a genuine uh, API request. So <clears throat> let's look at some examples. Uh, those of you who have seen me present before, I don't particularly like using the big, the big data breach examples, um, partly because I think there's so many of them. Um, and you're picking on some big companies who happen to have been unlucky. Uh, it doesn't make them bad companies. And the good thing about security is there's so many examples to choose from um, that you can actually, every given week, I can use a different example because they're, they're popping up all the time. This one is a vulnerability example um, to do with uh, Uber. So I tend to use uh, security researcher type examples, um, partly because they often expose how easy this is to do. And also, there's usually a bit more detail, clear detail about exactly how it's been done. But you know that if it's being done by, so, by security uh, researchers, then it's being done on a big scale by, um, by uh, darker people, let's say. <coughs> so 
this one is simply, you know, applying a, a making an API quest with either, you know, you can do it with having garbage in, in one of the fields, and basically the API will leak a whole lot of information that you can then reuse. Um, and that's a, that's a, a common type of uh, vulnerability that you will see. Um, this one I rather like. This is quite a new one. So Voy, who all of, the, all of you will know. In fact, I'm, perhaps there's somebody in the room from the company. Um, but anyway, this is uh, an example of a researcher who managed to put a whole lot of credit onto his Voy account. And I, I, we actually do quite a lot of work in the mobility space, more on the uh, car sharing, car rental, automotive side than, than the e-scooter side. Um, but um, I'm kind of amused by all this. And, and, and the picture on the, uh, the right-hand side, I actually took outside the hotel last night. Um, so this is the kind of carnage that you get from uh, e-scooters at the end of the day when they get dumped and abandoned in all kinds of interesting places. Uh, so I, I, having spent a couple of days here in Stockholm, I, I've been stepping over uh, e-scooters all the time. It must be extremely annoying uh, for some. But anyway, this was a, an example of um, a researcher who managed to put a lot of credit onto uh, his account and simply did it. It took him, according to the report here, it took him three hours to, to do it. But basically what he was doing was he was picking up um, uh, discount vouchers or, or free time vouchers and just repeatedly putting them on and on again the same on, on his account until he had just you know, done that repeatedly. So he was basically producing a script that was behaving like the app as if somebody was putting those vouchers through the app. But of course, um, it wasn't actually the app. And actually, the, the talk that Francois did last night, Francois from, uh, from Ping, was interesting. He talked about um, how you have to think about uh, the security that you put in the mobile app and, and realize that people may bypass it and access the API directly so that, uh, and this is exactly what it, this situation, I actually picked out this text last night and added it because it, it, it articulates exactly what he was saying. Security was in the app, but if you come onto the API directly, it bypasses uh, a lot of the checks that, that you would normally uh, get if you were going to use the app. Um, <clears throat> so. Getting into more specifics about why why mobile? Um, well, mobile, as I said, is the most difficult uh, you know area to to defend against for a couple of reasons. Number one is, uh, and actually uh, Michael mentioned that in his presentation, that the, the code is available to anyone. So you can download a mobile app off the App Store. You can spend as much time as you like messing around with it, reverse engineering it, figuring out how the API works, etc. And then you can decide what you're going to do with that information. So it really is um, untrustworthy. And you need to think very carefully about what stuff you put into that uh, mobile app. Because whatever you put into it can be taken out by somebody. The other interesting thing about mobile apps is they actually are natural rate limiters. They will, um, because you have to use the app to enter information, they will naturally rate limit the frequency with which you can do things, um, which actually saves you in many cases. But as soon as you bypass the app and get onto that API directly, as in the bottom picture, suddenly you may be able to have a burst of API activity, which suddenly dumps out a load of uh, data. Now, when I say a burst of API activity, I'm not thinking about something that will probably trigger your rate limiting, because these APIs are rich, you can quite often extract quite a bit of information with a relatively low number of commands, which is, as I, as I said, is naturally rate limited through the mobile app, because the mobile app will probably only ask for data for a single user because it's being used by a single user. But once you bypass the app, you may be able to extract a lot more information. There's lots of ways you can protect. Um, this kind of thing, and I'm just, I've got a list here, and, and, and you certainly, what, there's no one answer. Uh, you don't have one solution that solves the problem. You probably need some or all of these. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about app authentication, which is what we do, um, but uh, it would be one piece of the, the puzzle that you're, you're going to need, and I'm, I'm surrounded in this session by experts on user authentication. As you'll see later on, user authentication is a, is a key component in this even though I'm not actually talking about it myself. <clears throat> so before we get into the specifics of the attacks I want to show you, it's important that you understand a bit about what we actually do. Because 
um, that will allow you to see where we've helped, um, how, how certain things have happened. So approve is essentially two components that we deliver, an SDK that goes in your mobile app, um, and you simply drop it in and call it. And then there's a cloud service that we operate. The cloud service is actually the piece that does the remote authentication. And simplistically, uh, we often call it a DNA test. And the, the objective of calling it a DNA test is just simply to make it clear to you that it is doing a very low level, uh, deep analysis of the code that's running on the mobile device so that it can check that that code is present and also that it, is, it has not been modified in any way. So as in the DNA, any small modification will modify the DNA, you'll be able to detect that. That's exactly the same principle. It's also a dynamic process, so every few minutes, it will re-authenticate that the app is still present. So it's not a, a once-in-time check, it's doing it throughout the operation of the app. Before you start worrying about it, your users will not notice it's there. It's completely invisible from them. And the concept of it is that it, it, there will be a, a, a JWT token will be passed through the mobile app and down to the back end API. The, the little yellow keys are just supposed to indicate to you that there's a secret that's shared between our cloud service and your back end API that you can use to check that the tokens are signed with the correct secret. The app itself knows nothing about the secret. It knows nothing about anything. There's the SDK that we put in there has nothing in it that's useful. Um, and that's the important part of what we do. Now, in addition to uh, checking that the, the app is present and unmodified, we also do all kinds of interesting checks about the environment that the app is running in. So we do root and jailbreak detection, emulation, debugger, frameworks, etc. And that will be important in a moment. Um, we also do uh, certificate pinning. We also do uh, over-the-air security updates. So if you want to change the security policies there, um, and the policies are important, um, then you can do that over the air. We can do remote um, um, interrogation of suspect mobile devices if you want to dig in and find out exactly what's going on on a particular device that you think is misbehaving. You can do that too. That coming back to the security policy, that's quite important because we have customers across the spectrum from uh, the retail world to financial services and everywhere in between. And they have different policies about what they allow in terms of platform. So um, a retail comp a company will often allow rooted phones. A financial services company will not allow that. So the customer, our customer, has to and will set the security policy that they want. We detect all the stuff but they decide what constitutes a bad environment or a bad device, if you like. Um, and then they set that. And that's important for the next slide, where I'm getting into the actual uh, attack itself. So let's look at some fun pictures. <coughs> so this is, a, this is a real attack. We were actually quite lucky with this attack. The customer wasn't that lucky, but we were quite lucky in the sense that we were able to collect some quite interesting information from this one. So what you're seeing is that, in fact, on the right-hand side, you see the green traffic. On the right-hand side, that's kind of that's a steady-state traffic. And what's happened is there's been a blast of traffic. And what you can see is that initially, um, it was getting through, um, which is not good news for anyone. And the reason it was getting through is that the Frida, I don't know, some of you may know about Frida. Frida is an instrumentation framework. It's a free tool. It's an extremely powerful tool for messing around with stuff, we'll call it that. Um, and um, the customer did not have that switched on in their security policy. As you'll see in a moment, we were detecting it. But because they had decided that that wasn't important, because they frankly made a mistake. Um, this particular attack got through until uh, we worked out what was going on. And then you see it switching to the red stuff uh, towards the end, which is basically when Frida was switched on and the attack was then stopped. A couple of other interesting things about this picture is that the app, app authentication was working, which means that the attack had to be done through the app. So this app, this attack was going through the app. The, it had to be using the app as a mechanism to get to the API. If the, if the customer had tried any other way, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have worked. So it could have been worse. 
Also, the customer, or sorry, the attacker was cycling the IP addresses, was also uh, cycling device IDs. So if you were thinking that you could use uh, IP address blacklisting, device ID blacklisting to get around this, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have helped you because it was already built into what they were doing that they were cycling regularly so that uh, they would get around any, any blacklisting like that. And what we did was they, they asked us to look into this, and we went back in time, and we saw this. Three weeks before, you see the little spike of green here, and that was the, that was the test phase. So that was when the attacker, because we, we were lucky in this one too, because the attacker was a little bit sloppy, and there was some reuse of device ID and IP address that allowed us to identify that this was the same person or same setup. You can see there that they were doing some testing, and it was passing. So they had, they had worked out that they had an attack that was going to work. But it was three weeks before they actually came in and did it. And um, the other thing I want to point out is here you've got about three times the rate they came in at was about three times normal traffic. So again, think about your rate limiting that you've got in your API. Would you have noticed that? Um, I wonder. <coughs> And going back even further, we then looked at our detection. And here we can see the first instance of using Frida that was seen on this account. Um, now, we detected it, but it did not result in a bad token within our security system because the customer had chosen to have a security policy which allowed Frida. Um, so it was detected, but not, didn't result in a bad token. <coughs> Even before that, going back, we also found this. And you can see in the middle, there's a little red spike there. And that was uh, some initial attempts to do stuff which failed. So there was an initial attempt to, to, to get in uh, without using Frida, which was failing. And then the, the attacker switched to using Frida, found that it, that it worked, and then came back with the big attack. So you can actually see over a sort of six-week period that they were working away at you know, figuring out how to do this and then came in and, and did, the, did the attack. Um, now, one thing I want to mention, which is important, is that we all the uh, IP address and device ID information is all anonymized. So we can tell that we've seen the IP address before or the device ID before. We don't know what it is. That's very important from a GDPR point of view, um, that you don't want to be collecting that kind of information. <clears throat> so in summary, you will find uh, API abuse in the noise. Okay, it's not going to come up and slap you in the face. It's going to be done in a very subtle, subtle fashion, and it's going to come from multiple IP addresses and device IDs. When it comes at scale, it can come in a couple of different ways. It can come reasonably high frequency, like the first example I showed. It can also come quite slowly. So sometimes um, the attacks will come, and they will just be above the normal traffic levels, so you may not even uh, even know that it's going on. You probably don't assume that hackers are dumb. Uh, they're absolutely not. They're very, very smart people. They've got great tools as well. <clears throat> they will attack anyone. And anyone who has a, if there's, if there's an angle to make money, <laughs> then they're going to do it. Uh, so don't assume, because uh, I hear this quite a lot. Well, I don't know that people are interested in what we do, our API. Nobody knows about our API. Nobody uses it, etc. cetera. Uh, mm, somebody will find it. This is what API abuse should look like. So this is an example of where an attack came in, and it did not succeed at all. Um, so you can see lots of red spikes. You can see that the, the steady state of traffic uh, is maintained, which means that the end users have not been inconvenienced. It means that the attack that took, attempted attack that took place didn't work. So what do you need to do to secure remote clients? Um, you need to check that the app is present. So make sure that the app is not being bypassed. You need to make sure it's not modified. You need to make sure that the runtime environment it's, it's operating in is good. You define what is good. Um, and don't do any checking, any kind of you know, testing, secrets, whatever, in the app itself, because that's a really, really bad idea. App authentication is, in our view, a complementary uh, approach to user authentication. Um, sits alongside it. 
actually uh, we have customers who combine our tokens with uh, OAuth tokens so that they can basically bind an app authentication process to a uh, to a user uh, session and so on so so this is the kind of thing that uh, people people implement so just to wrap up then <clears throat> there are many kinds of API abuse I bet your APIs are being abused right now as you're sitting in this room and if you don't think that's the case, then I would challenge you to prove it um, by thinking, how would you prove that nobody was abusing your API? Um, <clears throat> and remember that what you saw, even at the highest level of traffic in the examples I showed you, was three to four X your steady state traffic. What's your rate limit set at? I won't even, the rhetorical question, you know the answer to that. And I know the answer to it too, and it's a lot higher than that. <clears throat> And I believe that you need some specific solutions, of course, uh, for this. Some resources that might be of interest to you. Um, there's a mobile API security ebook, um, which we have. It doesn't talk about approve at all, actually. It's really generally about good, good practice for, for uh, mobile API security. Uh, we also have a serverless API proxy that, that we've just, just released this ebook, actually. So this is for. Um, getting all the uh, API key management and uh, token checking done uh, in Amazon. And quite often we get asked questions about, well, you know, there's this device check thing that Apple has and there's a safety net thing that Google has. That's what that does, isn't it? No. Actually, safety net and device check are different from each other and they're also different from approved. So if you want to understand how all that fits together. There's a couple of app notes there. Um, so you can either download these from the website. Um, I've got a piece of paper. If you want to come and give me your uh, name, I'll make sure they get sent to you if that's easier for you, whatever, whatever suits you. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm around all day if you want to come and have a chat with me about any of this stuff. Thank you.